there are so many human beings in this room right now. <laughs> it's really a privilege to be here, and I really thank all of you for sharing this space with me, especially my mentors. Hi. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, basically, I want to talk about identity and how I see it forming in my own life and how I've experienced it forming in other people's lives by um, this collective experience of music, specifically hip hop. Um, and in keeping with today's conference, I study specifically hip hop and queer theory together, which a lot of people are often like, why would you do that? Well, I'll tell you. So <laughs> um, I don't have a PowerPoint or anything because I want this to be like a story because it's the story of my life. <laughs> um, so I want to start off with an anecdote. Um, when I was a senior in high school, I took an elective called the History of American Women. And I really liked the class. Uh, it was one of the first times that I had any kind of feminist text in the classroom. Um, and the best part about the class was that the final project was completely open-ended. We could write about anything. So I decided to write about women rappers and blues singers and black feminist thought because I love hip hop so much and I've been listening to it my whole life. Um, and I had a lot of really inspirational people that I met, met through hip hop. Um, and I really wanted to showcase that. And I wanted also to read more about black feminism and women of color. So I decided to write that paper. And I remember I was in the middle of writing this paper when I got a phone call from my principal. And my principal said that he wanted me to act as a representative for my school as a valedictorian at the annual barbecue for valedictorians and salutatorians at the mayor's mansion. And obviously, I was super excited. And I said yes right away, because um, we didn't rank students at my high school. So it wasn't just based on GPA. It was more about being a representative. And I felt that was a huge honor. So I immediately hung up the phone on my principal. And I called my mom. And I was in the middle of dialing her number when I had this sinking feeling in my heart. And I just remember really wondering if they only picked me because I was one of the only Latina students at the school. And um, that sinking feeling didn't really go away. It was constantly with me. And I remember bringing it to that barbecue. And I showed up super decked out, because I was really excited. Um, but I was the only student there without her family. And all the other students there had brought family and friends, and they all knew someone. And it was actually one of the loneliest experiences of my life, because not only did I physically not know anyone there, but I felt like everyone in that room belonged there except for me. And I, was, I spent the whole time wondering, if what my friends were, said was true, because when I told them the news that I had been selected as this representative, uh, one of them actually said to me, well, it's clearly not based on GPA, because <laughs> this girl has the highest GPA in the class. They probably just want a Latina valedictorian in front of the mayor. And that kept replaying in my mind while I was there. And um, I didn't really want to tell anyone that, but I remember it brought me into my mentor's office hours my first year of Wellesley. And I was sitting there, and I was struggling, and I didn't know what I was. Like, my whole life, I've known I was Latina. My parents immigrated here from Cuba. And I knew I was Latina. I knew that I grew up on 207th Street. Woo. And um, I knew that I was queer, although that was also a journey. But <laughs> I end up in the seat in my mentor's office hours, and she suggested I read a book called This Bridge Called My Back, which is an anthology uh, of writing by radical women of color. And it's edited by um, Sherry Moraga and Gloria Saldua. And that book, seriously, it changed my life. I read it cover to cover in one night. And ever since then, I've carried this experience of bridging with me. I see myself as a bridge between experiences, uh, between cultures, my parents and my own, and between parts of myself that often seem like they're not bridgeable. And that experience at the mayor's barbecue has really it stuck with me in a way that led me into this academic and personal curiosity about identity. And how is it that we decide which identities we keep with us and which we don't get to decide? Like, which box we have to check on a test? And so it took me uh, into many different classrooms, including many of my mentors' classes. And uh, I remember in one of them, we were reading another work by Gloria Anzaldúa. Um, and it's that work, and it was that, it's called Borderlands, La Frontera. And in that work, she talks about a unity of knowledge. And in keeping with today's conference, of course, I learned throughout my time at Wellesley taking classes in various departments that there is a certain unity of knowledge between the natural and physical sciences and the social sciences and humanities that's required to think about identity and how we form our own identities. But there's also a certain unity of our mind and body knowledges 
that Gloria Ann Valdua and many other women of color scholars have written about that I think is equally important when we think about processing our identities and, and thinking about the ways that our identities are formed. And what she means by these mind and body knowledges are that instead of adhering to a kind of cultural reverence of objectivity, we should be thinking about the ways that our emotions, our feelings, our instincts, and our lived bodily experiences shape the way that we form a sense of self in relation to the world. Because often those experiences, such as the kind of heart pumping experience of being feeling lonely and isolated at a mayor's barbecue, they end up really having a profound effect on the way that you analyze your own identity later on. So fast forward um, through four years of Wellesley, going through and constantly questioning myself and having this question of identity in the back of my mind, I still haven't found the right word to use to identify myself. I know that, you know, I know all these things about myself, but I still haven't figured out how to give credence and respect to my African and indigenous ancestors while articulating the reality of white privilege. And that kind of thinking led me to my senior year. I decided to write a thesis on the queerness of hip hop because in all of the classes that I was taking and all the readings and assignments I was doing, I was listening to hip hop the whole time, often on my way to class, and it was the cathartic experience of physically listening to those beats and the hard hitting beats that often got me through those walks. Um, and I started realizing that a lot of the answers that I was searching for were in those lyrics, they were in the sonic experience of listening to hip hop. And what I, what I mean by that is uh, when I finally concluded, kind of concluded, my thesis and my research, I found that there are these four identity models and identity interventions that we can trace from queer theory and their queer theoretical ideas of what identity mean or how we should be thinking about identity. Um, and you can see them being played out in hip hop. And we can see rappers articulating those same theories in hip hop. Um, so during my senior year, I was focusing only on LGBTQ rappers because I wanted to showcase that there are amazing queer and trans rappers that are speaking for themselves and using hip hop as a space for social change. Um, and I also, just because I selfishly really like all of the rappers that I was writing about. And I got to interview some of them, so it was a win-win. Um, and so for today, I'm going to talk about three of those identity interventions and how I see them being played out in one song by Las Crudas. And I'll tell you more about Las Crudas later. So the three identity interventions, two of them I took, um, I found in this brilliant anthology called Queer Theory um, by Ian Moreland and Annabelle Wilcox. And in the introduction, of uh, the anthology, they lay out these kind of identity models. And the first one is identity as performative speech act, which is an idea articulated by Judith Butler. The second is identity as normative community commitments, which is described by Mark Norris Lance and Alessandro Tanasini. And then the third that I'm gonna talk about today is disidentifications, uh, which is from Jose Esteban Munoz's brilliant work about how queer people of color engage with identity. So, Las Crudas. I'm going to talk more about those things, don't worry. Um, <laughs> Las Crudas is this amazing feminist hip hop collective from Cuba. They're queer Afro-Cuban women who have an amazingly womanist discography with songs like La Gorda, The Fat Girl, which is the song I'm going to talk about. Um, no Me Dejaron, They Didn't Let Me, which is a song about racist and sexist <coughs> migration policies and the history of colonization. Um, and the third is Eres Bella, um, which is You Are Beautiful. It's one of my favorite songs as well. So today I'm going to talk about La Gorda. And um, in La Gorda, the chorus is essentially a repetition of, for those of you who call me fat, big, I am fat, I'm big, and I'm in your house, so I'm here taking up this space, and it's your space, but now it's my space. Um, <laughs> and that exclamation of I am La Gorda, I am the fat girl, is an awesome example of Judith Butler's notion of identity as performative speech act. So what Judith Butler argues is that certain identities are imbued with such political meaning that, for example, she uses don't ask, don't tell, and um, a military personnel under don't ask, don't tell saying, I am a homosexual. That becomes a, a performance of the act of homosexuality itself in kind of this context of political meaning because a military personnel saying that is at risk of getting discharged, right? So, when we think about how we just saying something can be a performance of the very act we're describing, 
You see that in Las Crudas' uh, chorus when they say, for those of you who call me fat, I am fat. I'm the fat girl. Um, and that becomes a performance of the same excessiveness and fatness that's being demonized, right? So they're, they're, they're turning the identity and the notion of fatness of a fat woman on its head because often fat women are demonized in our society for taking up too much space in a society where women are socialized to be smaller and to shrink themselves. So Las Brudas getting up there and saying, I am the fat girl, becomes a performance of the same act of taking up space. So then, moving on to identity as normative community commitments, uh, which Mark Norris Lance and Alessandro Tanasini describe as being an alternative vision of identity as neither biologically constructed or socially constructed. But instead, identity is about the moral and political judgments that tie us to communities. So we see this happening again in Las Crudas' song, La Gorda, because calling themselves La Gorda, they relate it throughout the verse to being connected to an African diasporic tradition of um, taking up space, of creating art that's very vibrant. They connect all of that to this longer trajectory in this history, especially in Cuba and the Caribbean. And they go on to say that um, you know, La Gorda becomes a moral and political judgment about the hegemonic standards of beauty, which are based as they explain, on racist and sexist notions of what beauty is. Um, so that's kind of an example of another identity model. And then the last one, disidentifications, um, Jose Esteban Munoz's theory, I see articulated the best in a response that Las Crudas gave to me when I interviewed them. So I asked them, why hip hop? Why would you use hip hop, which is dominantly characterized in pop culture as being like, irredeemably sexist, homophobic, and violent, why is this the space where you choose to make your social change and your mark on the world? And their answer really struck, stuck with me, and it's something I think about a lot. Um, roughly translated and summarized, they said that they wanted to raise a voice that is silenced, and that continues to be silenced and has been throughout history. And they wanted to use their own voice in poetry so that other marginalized people could find their own. And I see there, and, and they go on to say too that hip hop was just one of the spaces that they would occupy to make themselves visible. And that in fact hip hop was created to make them visible. And so I took that to heart immediately after reading Jose Esteban Munoz's work because he, he argues that queer people of color don't just entirely assimilate into these dominant notions of what queer and of color identities are, but they also don't just diametrically oppose and reject them. Instead, it's a constant negotiation and a constant engaging and bridge making between all of these parts of ourselves and society. And so that, I thought, was a great example. And they go on to say that they wanted to cast their footprints in stone so that they had a path to follow and other people, other queer people of color, had an, a similar path to follow. And Jose Esteban Munoz, in his book, he calls that utopian blueprints. He says that queer people of color are constantly negotiating and drawing up these blueprints so that they can go through the process of world making and making the world that they want to lay out. And that process begins with the individual and their identity negotiation. And so I often am thinking about, you know, what footprints am I leaving behind? And that constant introspection and question is present throughout hip hop. We see it in the popular hip hop and we see it in Las Crudas' work. We see it throughout. And I think it's a common experience that we all go through. And for me, I live at those bridges. I live on the bridges between queer theory and hip hop. And I need them both to understand myself and to understand how the world sees me and how I want to see the world. Thank you. Thank you.